Battle Reads U.S. Grand History Chat interview with Jennifer Edgington. Ranger talks to a woman seated in classroom. Hello, everyone. And this is Nick Sacco, Park Ranger at Ulysses S. Grant National Historic Site in St. Louis, Missouri. And you're watching episode 12 of the U.S. Grant History Chat. And my guest for today's interview is Jen Edgington. She works at the Kenosha Public Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin. And uh, right now we're in October of 2020, the National Park Service, we're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. And I wanted to have Jen on because she happens to be doing a lot of research on Hispanics in the American Civil War. And uh, I wanted to learn a little bit more about the topic myself. So it's my pleasure to have Jen Edgington on the program. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And to start things off, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your background and what kind of sparked your interest in studying the American Civil War in the first place. Absolutely. Um, so I have always been interested in the Civil War. Um, I say that it dates back to my dad and my two grandpas. They just all were really, really excited about the Civil War. And being the youngest in the Edgington line, I got to hear all the stories. So it was really exciting for me. And so I really grew up loving it and really needing more of it. So my parents really encouraged this learning and bought me books. And I always thought I'd be a history teacher. So I went to Michigan State University and expecting to study history, but I actually ended up in archaeology and museum studies. So kind of this applied history and implied education. And I really wanted to actually go into battlefield archaeology and focus on Civil War um, archaeology in that capacity. But I got my first job in museum education and I completely fell in love. <laughs> so I haven't yeah. lost the field. Um, but for me, I never really thought I would be working in a Civil War museum. So it's amazing. And I feel like I have to pinch myself every day because I'm so excited. Um, but I've been here about four and a half years. So I work primarily in teaching about people at the Kenosha Museum campus. So I'm at the Civil War Museum and I'm at the Public Museum. And I'm able to broaden our landscape of how we talk about the Civil War. So we don't necessarily talk about the battles, but we talk about the people that fought in those battles. We talk about the people who um, were back home and we talk about the seven states that make up the upper Midwest. So we do have a pre focus lens, but within that lens, we have a very broad narrative. We can talk about the natives that live in the area. We can talk about the women and the children and African Americans, um, as well as Irish immigrants and German immigrants that were in this um, area in particular. So for me, my like excited part of my job is being able to tell these stories of people that you may have not heard before or people that are kind of lost to history. So um, long story, but <laughs> I've always been interested in the Civil War and in particular telling those stories continuously for me. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it starts with people really studying history in general. It, it, you start with just those experiences of people who lived in the past and then just kind of build from there. You know, you can learn about battles. You can learn about politicians and military strategy, but you have to start with individual stories. Absolutely. And, and along those lines, um, I think the is studying and understanding the Hispanic experience or experiences plural uh, in the Civil War. It's a subject that's not really been covered very well within um, Civil War studies. And uh, I would love for you to kind of speak to us a little bit about some of those experiences. H Hispanics that are serving on the front lines, maybe others who are staying on the home front, you know, their loyalties during the war. I'd love to just hear kind of a, a general introduction into the topic. Sure. Um, I think that especially when we talk about Hispanics and Latinx that were around during this time, we really need to be mindful that there's not a lot of research being done with these people that live during this time. Personally, I'm really interested in it because I am Latina. I am someone that this is reflects my background and my great, great, great grandparents were alive in Mexico close to the border when this was happening. So for me, it's so rooted in my context of who I am. And so that's why I was really excited to start this process and get really in, embedded in the research. Um, and so looking at 
the museum that we work with or that I work with, we're working on an immigrant exhibit coming up in December. And so I was kind of tasked to, I say, do the fun, the fun research. So I talked about Pacific Islanders and Asian and then Hispanic and Latinx soldiers. So that was my scope which was so exciting because there isn't a ton of research so it really was pulling in new um maybe less known resources to build this story so primarily when we think of the upper midwest in the 1860s where i'm from there's not a lot of hispanics or latinx people living in this area like there is now so we had to expand our scope a little bit more and focus on those bigger cities i our museum only focuses really on the union. So my expertise is kind of the, the union side of this. So we're starting to see more Hispanic and Latinx in the East Coast. So in particular, New York, in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, we start to see larger kind of communities. That being said, most Hispanics and Latinx that fought in the Civil War actually fought in Texas and the Southwest. So when we look at Texas in general, um, not too far before the Civil War was the Mexican-American War, which Mexico reduced by about half of the size of it. So these people that are living in Texas are no longer Mexicans. They're now Texans. <laughs> so we need to remember that, that a lot of them were born in Mexico, but are now in the United States because of this war. And so when we look at that, we know Texas was in the Confederacy, but not every single Hispanic that, or Mexican that lived in Texas was for the Confederate cause. So um, you do see some that are rebelling against. You do see some that are leaving Texas um, to go back to Mexico, but you do see soldiers that are being trained and um, kind of operating out of Texas, but then also going to Eastern campaigns as well. So yes, the Confederacy in um, Texas it had a lot of Hispanics and Mexicans that fought in the Civil War, but there were also Union troops that were being raised in Texas as well. So for example, um, there was one that was actually out of there by John Hayes was the colonel of it in the second Texas Cavalry. So they actually were founded around the Rio Grande itself. So we do know that there were federal troops being raised in that area too. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and, and to your point, I think for um, for some of the people living in Texas, the, the border sort of came to them really twice because, uh, you know, they're born in Mexico and Mexicans, but then with the, in a, you know, the end of the Mexican-American War, they're Americans. But then with the oncoming of the Civil War, they were now Confederate Americans, so the border kind of came to them twice. Absolutely. And um, to kind of go back to um, our talk about individuals, I would love to hear maybe just the stories of maybe one or two Hispanics uh, during the Civil War that we kind of we can learn from their experiences during the war to maybe help us better understand this topic. Absolutely. And I know we often when we think about the Civil War, we don't necessarily think about um, the far west like we were just talking about. We really do study this east and west is the middle. So going back to my stories of primarily being in the east, because that's what we know and what we study. Um, there's there's two in particular. One, I mean, there's so many amazing stories of Hispanics that fought in the Civil War, um, kind of the mastermind behind the underground portion of the crater was from Argentina. So that's a Hispanic, wow. Henry Pleasant from the 48th. Um, and he was a civil engineer and a miner. And so he kind of understood the whole process of what it would take to dig under um, ground. So that's a great one. But I really wanted to focus on when I saw this question, um, my two brothers that I always love to talk about, the Cavada brothers, and they are from Cuba. So there was actually three, but one never fought in the war. And the older brother was Fred or Frederico Fernandez Cavada. And then the brother was Adolfo Fernandez Cavada. So Fred, the older brother, ended up um, enlisting in the 23rd Pennsylvania. Then he got recruited to do the balloon corps because he was such a good artist. So he served in the balloon corps. 
Then he um, ended up in leadership of the 114th Pennsylvania, where he fought in Gettysburg. And at Gettysburg, he's actually captured. And um, so he has to live, I think about six months in Libby prison. And so at Libby prison, he actually passes his time writing a book. He's drawing pictures of his experience. He's writing about what is happening in the prisons. And oh, his prose are so beautiful, and but also so sad to read. And he talks about being there for Christmas and it, it's a lot, but it's amazing. And the book still survives. You can read it. It's great. Um, and Kavada actually ends up getting released and he's very sick. He's very um, skinny. He's not well taken care of in prison, as, as we know. Um, and he ends up later on asking for actually a position back in Cuba. So he becomes a consul in Trinidad de Cuba, which is a city there. And he's there for about five years. And then he decides he's going to take up arms in the 10th, uh, the 10 year or Cuba 10 year war. And so he actually joins the Cuban cause to fight against the Spanish. And he becomes the commander in chief of all Cuban forces. So, yeah, so this guy that has fought, you know, through the Civil War, he was a balloon artist and he has amazing paintings, too, that are actually still in um, the National Museum of Art in Cuba. And so he unfortunately is kept and executed by Spanish forces. His brother is also signs up for the Civil War 23rd with his brother. He actually becomes a staff member of um, General Humphreys. And he then is at Gettysburg. And I think what I love so much is he wrote a very detailed journal of what happened. And it's it's so graphic and it puts you in the middle of it. But throughout his days in Gettysburg, he's writing to try and find his brother. And as kind of a tenant of Hispanic and Latinx culture, family is so incredibly important. And to see him continuously say, I'm looking for Fred, I'm trying to find my brother. Finally, he gets word that he thinks his brother fell and he's very worried that he died, but he finds out, okay, he was captured. So there's some kind of hope. Um, so his journal is really, really amazing to read. And he ends up following his brother's footsteps almost Exactly. He becomes a consul in Cuba as well. He then takes over um, a smaller division of the Cuban army that his brother vacates for commander in chief. And then in battle in Cuba, he um, dies in action. So this is just this amazing story of these two Cuban brothers that kind of balance this living in Philadelphia, you know, born in Cuba, living in Philadelphia and then going back and finishing their life in Cuba. And what an amazing story of, of brotherhood and, you know, shared experiences in combat and then, you know, serving for multiple countries, first for the United States and then eventually going back to their homeland in Cuba. That's that's really an amazing story. And are there any books out there about the Cavada brothers or is that is that waiting to still be uh, written in a book? I'm hoping that there's books that come out because their story mm -hmm. is so dynamic and just it seems very epic, right? Like an epic tale. I have not found um, any on both brothers. However, I have read Libby Life. And then right after um, Frederico's death, his friend who actually served with him wrote a sketches of him. And so it's kind of picking apart. It's really cute. It's named something like um, a sketch of a gentleman, a patriot, a warrior, a poet and a victim and so it's really a one-sided kind of tale but with Frederico and I didn't mention this but there's so much being done to save him from the Spanish um according to this little sketch I read he's actually telegraphing pretty big names that we know from the Civil War to try and pardon him so he actually reaches out to Dan Sickles who is in Spain to get on um like a, hey, help, tell Spain to stop. We know him. He reaches out to Meade. He reaches out to Sheridan. So he's constantly trying to telegraph these people to help save his friend that he writes about after his death. Wow, that's really, really fascinating. And and not too long ago, I actually learned myself that um, David Farragut, the, uh, the naval officer, 
was I believe he has Spanish heritage himself yeah. too. So another another fascinating story, but not always told from the fact that he was Hispanic himself. So very cool, very yeah. cool. There's a lot of people we don't think of as being Hispanic. Um, there's I like to claim, although I think he might fall more in the Italian, is that Edward Ferrero was born in Spain, so he's Hispanic. Um, there is some leadership in the 54th that was also um, Hispanic. So we, once you start looking, you can start to see these ties of Hispanic and Latino soldiers throughout the Civil War that we just don't consider or don't think about. It's kind of hidden history. Absolutely. Really, really interesting stuff. And then finally, just to wrap up our conversation, uh, you mentioned you have this exhibit that you're working on that is slated to be uh, uh, sort of open to the public in December. Maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about that project and, and just kind of what you're planning on doing at the museum moving forward up there in Kenosha. Absolutely. Um, so our exhibit, we're really excited about it. We're making it in-house and we're looking at immigrants from all over that had impacts on the Union Army. So we've, again, we've done our research. We've found soldiers that came from the Philippines that fought for Michigan. We obviously being in Wisconsin, we have a lot of Germans <laughs> that <laughs> fought too sure. in Irish. So um, we're really trying to make it as immersive as possible. So later today, we actually have a, a Skype call that we're gonna record with someone from, um, I believe Norway to record the accent and the so we're trying to bring in the language and also a lot of the cultural significance of everyone that fought in the Civil War because like we said we focus on individuals in their story so with Hispanics there might have not been these huge regiments like there were of the Irish Brigade but they still were there and it's really important to tell their story and we found some really cool stuff like someone from the Bermudas someone from Hawaii. So, I mean, we're able to tell such a broad narrative of who these men were and how important immigration was before the Civil War. So really cool. it's really exciting. Um, that's one of our things. We've also just been working really hard to um, broaden our narratives in general. So we're installing different artifacts all the time. Um, we luckily just installed a amazing 1880s wheelchair and so we're trying to make sure that we talk about everyone that was around so we're talking about people with disabilities we're talking about people of hispanic descent we're talking about african americans that fought in the war or were free in this area so for us just that continuation of making sure that everyone sees themselves in our museum is really important and lastly, the best part, because it's me, um, we're working on school programs that are virtual. So we're trying to make sure that we can help teachers, even though they might not be in the classroom or they might be and not able to take field trips right now. Nice. That's really, really great. And I'm sure teachers watching this uh, program will be very interested to learn more about that. So. Thank you so much, Jen. Jen Edgington with the Kenosha Public Museum. Thanks for being on with us today. Thank you so much.